everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Welly, and I will say as a social scientist working at Google, it is my absolute delight to welcome Dr. Steven Pinker here today to talk to, about, talk to us about his new book called Rationality. Now, Dr. Steven Pinker is an experimental psychologist who conducts research in cognition, language, and social relations. He is currently the Johnstone Professor of Psychology at Harvard. He's taught at Stanford and at MIT. He's won many prizes for his research, his teaching, and his books, including The Language Instinct. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, a humanist of the year, a recipient of nine honorary doctorates, and one of Foreign Policy World's top 100 public intellectuals and Times 100 most influential people in the world. He was chair of the usage panel of the American Heritage Dictionary and writes frequently for the New York Times, The Guardian, and other publications. And that is an intro that I actually abridged significantly. So we had time for a conversation today. Uh, very accomplished. And um, I will welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Pinker, and we'll have a great conversation, I'm sure. Welcome, Dr. Pinker, and thank you for your time today. Uh, thanks, Brian. Delighted to be here. I um, had a wonderful weekend reading your book, um, and I learned a tremendous amount, and I have a ton of questions. Uh, but before I get there, the first, the first question is, uh, why did you write this book? Why now? What was the impetus for it? Well, it's a book that I would, uh, had always envisioned writing because like many social scientists, I th think that many of the tools that we use in our own research ought to be at the fingertips of every educated person, that e everyone should have some grasp of probability, of logic, of Bayesian reasoning, of distinguishing correlation from causation. I uh, taught a, a course at Harvard uh, uh, as the pandemic unfolded. Uh, called Rationality. It originated with some students who asked if I would teach a course on effective altruism. That is the use of rational evaluation of where your philanthropic dollars and hours would do the most good. I thought that was uh, narrower as a course topic than what I would be comfortable with, but I thought I could fold it in as one example of applied rationality. Uh, that is the the, the techniques of, of collecting data, of being open to evidence, basing your beliefs on degree of evidence, that has also been applied in evidence-based medicine, in money ball in sports, in evidence-based uh, uh, policing, in uh, uh, a variety of domains. Uh, so I thought a combination of the tools of rationality applications of rationality, but then the kicker, and you know, why, why 2021? Uh, it's because there's a widespread impression that the world is losing its mind, <laughs> that at the same time as we are applying rationality in new domains, such as philanthropy and sports and journalism, uh, we're, we're seeing a profusion of fake news and conspiracy theories and medical quackery and paranormal woo-woo. Uh, how can one species uh, at the, on the one hand, be so rational, and on the other hand, be so open to poppycock and, and, and flapdoodle. That's an interesting challenge for a psychologist, namely, what is this thing called human nature that can be so rational and irrational? So those are all of the motives for writing rationality now. Awesome, and it definitely resonates for me at a time when I'm extraordinarily busy and Q4 is tough for many employees in different roles. Um, the opportunity to talk with you about this book came up and I, and I looked at the title, I perused the contents and I'm like, I must read this book now because I too feel like there's a whole lot of irrationality after reading the book. I've determined that there might be some availability heuristic going on there, but it still feels <laughs> kind of irrational. Um, before we get into the depths of logic and Bayesian reasoning and the applications of those things, um, I wanted to talk about your starting point for this. You write. We can understand human nature only by considering the mismatch between the environment in which we evolved and the environment we find ourselves in today. Why is that such an important starting point? Yeah, so I've been an advocate of importing evolutionary analysis into psychology, the, the field called evolutionary psychology. But there is a, a kind of, I guess, a cartoon version of evolutionary psychology that I, I thought was being invoked far too glibly in <clears throat> explanations of human irrationality, which is, well, what, what can you expect from 
uh, a species that evolved on the savanna to chuck spears at antelopes and to avoid becoming lunch for lions. We have a bunch of quick reflexes, and uh, that, that explains why we believe in you know, QAnon or vaccine conspiracy theories. I, I thought that wasn't quite right for a number of reasons. One of them is that at least the approach to evolutionary psychology that I have advocated, inspired in large part by John Tooby and Lita Cosmides, uh, <coughs> psych psychologist and anthropologist respectively at UC Santa Barbara, is that humans have, uh, are, are a deeply weird primate. I mean, we're not your typical mammal, we're not your typical primate because we are, um, we, we do have rationality. That is, we were selected to prosper in, in what they call the cognitive niche, namely the ability to develop mental models about the world, intuitive theories, if you will, to uh, play out scenarios in our mind's eye that allow us to understand our environment and to manipulate it to our advantage in the fashioning of tools and traps and baby slings and uh, extracting medicines and poisons from plants to cooperate, uh, to accomplish uh, collectively what none of us could accomplish individually. All of this mediated through the use of language. So we, we kind of started off as a pretty cerebral species. Uh, and uh, we need a deeper explanation for the irrationality that we see around us than just we were uh, kind of you know, a twitchy species that always want, worries about getting eaten by a leopard. Uh, and indeed, I begin the book with a characterization of the San people of the Kalahari Desert, one of the longest surviving hunter-gatherers, and therefore thought to be, uh, offer at least some hints as to the environment in which we evolved, to show that they, you know, they, they're not so irrational. They, in fact, they depend on rationality for, for their for their livelihood, for their existence. That is, they track animals based on active hypothesis testing from fragmentary evidence that the animals leave behind, their tracks and, and also um, broken branches and upturned stones. Uh, they're kind of scientists or detectives, and they engage in a lot of what we would call critical thinking. They uh, learn to mistrust their first impressions. If there is an, uh, uh, an authority, a tribal elder who thinks that the tracks came from one kind of animal, but a young upstart thinks that it came from a different kind of animal, he'll, he'll challenge the elder. That is, they don't accept arguments from authority. They engage in a kind of Bayesian reasoning. If a particular track is ambiguous between two kinds of animals, even if it leans toward you know, animal A, if animal B is more common in that environment, they'll say, well, you know, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a, um, a, a diker, but it's more likely to be a springbok because they're more common uh, in this part of the desert. Uh, they engage in logical reasoning. They distinguish correlation from causation. They kind of have to because that's the only way in which you can uh, master reality. And for sure, they got to master reality. So I, I, it's how I begin the book. And it's a different use of uh, evolutionary thinking than the one that just says, oh, we're, we're cavemen out of time. What do you expect? Yeah, and what's interesting about that example is uh, coming into it, reading about a uh, society that doesn't have all the technological advances that we do, one might start to think, well, uh, we'll talk about their religion, sort of their explanation for natural events outside of science. And you use that example to show the logic that's grounded there. But on the flip side, we are living in a technologically rich, information rich environment, and yet we still believe in a lot of things we shouldn't. And I'm a victim of that too, and I think it's a perfect time for me to tell you a story about my refrigerator. Um, while, while I was reading your book this weekend, I went to go get a glass of water and the water dispenser on my refrigerator didn't work. All day long, I pressed that button waiting for water to come out and it didn't. Uh, right before I went to bed, I had these very expensive earbuds in my hands and I decided one last time to hit the button with the earbuds in my hand and of course, the water came out and dosed that and the first thing I thought was, of course, it needed a sacrifice. <laughs> and, uh, this is a logical person, but I have the moments of like sense making like immediately. And I think that's something that threads through your book. Well, I think it's a crucial point, And I'm glad you brought it up because we are all um, you know, vulnerable to these primitive intuitions, these forms of, of um, you know, magic and uh, um, uh, 
superstition. We know that they're magic and superstition because we've got formal science to disabuse us, but it's only if <clears throat> you've undergone the kind of um, deprogramming from modern science, probability theory, logic, and so on, that you can repress these uh, first impulses. Uh, and not everyone does. Either they um, go with their first impulse or they so mistrust the scientific establishment that the fact that it's the scientific consensus that vaccines are effective, human activity is warming the, the, uh, the planet, uh, just uh, don't register with them. And when you, come, when, you, when you think about it, very few of us know enough atmospheric chemistry to, um, and, or climate science to really retrace the, um, the, the evidence trail that lead, led to the scientific consensus. It's kind of like, well, if the people in the white coats say it, that's good enough for me. Uh, and conversely, the people who reject the scientific consensus, studies show are not necessarily scientifically illiterate. In fact, sometimes they are, they know the, especially if they're arguing against climate change, they may know the climate science better than uh, those who endorse the scientific consensus. They're using it as in their lawyerly briefs and, and, and presentations. Uh, the, what predicts people's belief on climate change is not how much science they know, but where they are in their uh, political beliefs. The farther you are to the right, the more you deny uh, the, the, the seriousness of climate change. Uh, and in fact, people who do accept the scientifically valid uh, conclusion often are out to lunch when it comes to the science. I mean, they think, oh, doesn't global warming, isn't that because of, you know, we, there are plastic straws in the ocean or the ozone hole or toxic waste dumps. Uh, they have this vague notion of green versus polluted. Uh, so it's not as if this coming to the scientifically valid conclusion requires following the science. It, it requires trust in scientific authorities uh, which many people uh, don't have for one reason or another. Yeah, and, and that actually brings me to something I did want to talk to you about, and that is um, the uh, the replicability challenge in the social sciences right now. So for those of you who, are about, who haven't yet read the book, uh, Dr. Pinker really follows multiple threads of logic and rationality from probability theory, Bayesian reasoning, cognitive biases, motivated reasoning, things like all of the elements are in play and where it comes to life is in specific examples uh, of people acting seemingly irrationally. Now I think about university professors, people whose professions and livelihoods are about doing research in systemic, rigorous ways, systematic, rigorous ways, following the scientific method. What they say we should just trust, like it's what you just said, Dr. Pinker, if somebody else has done all this work and they've got the expertise, I don't need to understand it. But we have over the last several years faced a replicability crisis um, among some research. Can you tell us what that is and what were the factors in play that led this to be even be possible in this profession? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> it, uh... Starting about 15 years ago, there were, I think, two events that led to what we now call the replicability crisis. One was a kind of subversive, cheeky, naughty article by the epidemiologist John Ioannidis, whose title was Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Uh, the other was a report in a respected psychology journal, Journal of Personality of Social Psychologists by an eminent psychologist, Daryl Bem, claiming to show evidence of a form of extrasensory perception, precognition. He, uh, in, in one of the studies, undergraduates looked at a computer screen. There were two curtains. The, uh, they were asked to predict which curtain uh, concealed a, uh, an erotic image before the computer actually ran its random number generator to decide where to place the, the image. And the um, argument was that, they, uh, that the students exhibited precognition. They knew what the computer would choose before it has, had chosen it. Using all of the conventional methods of statistical significance testing, going through peer review. And a number of us thought, I mean, I, I was incredulous and, uh, came to the conclusion, what, or at least asked the question, if a uh, prestigious journal could publish a 
obviously bogus result. I mean, bogus in the sense that it's very unlikely that our entire understanding of the laws of physics had been refuted by you know, some dinky studies showing some undergraduates some porn. Uh, how could that, what does that say about our standards of peer review and prestigious journals and, uh, and, and, and research practices? Uh, the Ioannidis article noted that because uh, scientific journals uh, have a bias against publishing negative findings, we have a bias against finding uh, publishing replications, I mean, it's so boring, and have a prejudice toward the new, the exciting, the counterintuitive. Uh, those are the ones that are least likely to be true because there was a reason why we considered them unintuitive or surprising, namely everything we've known up till then. And so as long as there is some possibility of a false positive, which of course there always is, there's going to be a bias toward publishing false positives because those are the ones that have the... Um, uh, where, the, where there was the greatest reason to believe that they were not true in the first place. That's what makes them surprising. And journalists contribute to that because they love the counterintuitive finding, the everything you always knew was wrong. Um, the, can, can you believe this? It so uh, you know, smacks us upside the head with our expectations. But you know, there's a reason we have expectations. The expectations are informed by everything we know. Now, the uh, I... Um, there are a number of fields. There was epidemiology, uh, social psychology, uh, some um, uh, some aspects of genetics, particularly the uh, single gene um, studies that were a big fad in the 1990s and first decade of the 21st century. Oh, we found the gene for um, homosexuality. We found the gene for language. We found the gene for obesity, uh, all of which turned out to be the opposite of Eureka. That is, they, they failed in the replication. Plus, all, uh, all kinds of medical and, and public health interventions, you know, antioxidants and asp daily aspirin and uh, hormone replacement therapy. So what's going on? Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I think there are a, a couple of, uh, of systematic reasons why there was so much error. One of them was... Uh, I think identified by Ioannidis, I don't think he used the logic of Bayesian reasoning. Bayesian reasoning being the um, application of the, of the rule discovered by the Reverend Thomas Bayes in the 18th century, namely you should adjust your credence in a hypothesis according to how plausible it was a priori, your priors, according to how likely it was that you would obtain those data if the hypothesis is true, the likelihood, divided by the commonness of the data. And the crucial part of that, that people often neglect, this is one of the cognitive biases identified by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, they call base rate neglect or, or prior neglect. Namely, people's heads are turned by the, uh, by the likelihood, by the flashy finding. Uh, this is exactly what you would expect to see if this was a miracle drug, if there was a gene for homosexuality, if, uh, um, if this um, miracle cure did work, um, and they uh, fail to take into account how plausible or likely the idea is in the first place based on everything we've known up till then. And, uh, in, the, and in the statistics that we tend to use in social science and, and many branches of science, namely null hypothesis significance testing, there is no consideration whatsoever of the prior, the prior probability. It's simply a, 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 an index, those statistics of if the hypothesis is false, what are the chances that you would get the data that you're getting? People misinterpret that as a Bayesian prob po posterior probability, namely, what are the chances that this hypothesis is true or false? And those are conceptually very different, and surveys show that a majority of social scientists confuse them. The result is that uh, the a, uh, extreme finding, even if it flies in the face of your priors, can be taken too seriously, magnified by the file drawer problem, uh, which is to say, if you get negative results, they're unpublishable, you put them in the file drawer. If you get positive results, you 
uh, publish them in science, you get calls from the New York Times, you give TED Talks. And so we could be uh, basically zooming in on all of the false positives, forgetting all of the uh, true negatives. Uh, uh, one final bit of, uh, so that's a failure of, of Bayesian reasoning. It's also a bit of a confusion between post hoc probability and a priori probability. Namely, the um, if you decide um, after the fact which phenomena to highlight and you don't consider uh, everything a priori, true or false, then you could zoom in on the positive claims, ignore all of the um, null effects, and falsely trumpet a non-existing finding. Sometimes called the Texas sharpshooter fallacy after the uh, marksman who fires a bullet into the side of a barn and then paints a bullseye around the hole. Um, and the, the final piece of the puzzle, and I'm sorry for going on at such length, but I do talk about it in the book, is uh, what's sometimes called questionable research practices, which means that after you have the data, you avail yourself of all of the different creative ways of analyzing the data. Well, maybe it's only in the men, maybe it's only in the women, maybe we should throw out the, uh, the, the year 2016 because everyone was distracted by the election and the crazy Trump year. Um, if the, the parametric test doesn't work, let's try the non-parametric test. If you have enough ways of analyzing the data, once you know what the data are, it's not that hard to massage it into a statistically significant result. Again, compounded by the practice of not publishing negative findings, but only positive findings. So those are... Uh, now, the reason that this is not an indictment of science is that it is scientists criticizing the practice of science and vowing to improve such as uh, since the replicability crisis became known, the practice of pre-registering studies, that is you commit yourself on a website to how you're gonna analyze the data before you gather them. And then the editors and reviewers can hold your feet to the fire and say, well, uh, sorry, but you analyze the data using method B, but you said you can analyze it according to uh, method A, that's not kosher. Um, to publishing failures to successful replications as well as failures to replicate. And the power of science and the power of rationality more generally is that it can always reflect back on itself. So if any, if any claim to being rational at any given moment is turns out to be dubious or fishy, you can always examine it with rationality to pinpoint why. And, and uh, that recursive power of rationality, that is, it can always examine itself, is the, the key to its power. Thank you for that. I, I love the example because um, you show how uh, multiple things can interact in order to drive an outcome, right? It wasn't simply uh, motivation to get published and you're withholding, right? It's a, it's system pressure, it's biases, it's failure to account for different um, baseline statistics. So thank you for taking us through that. I'll present like the other side now, which is that um, uh, analysis of data, um, complex methods that bring in a lot of information can present us with a much less biased view of events than we as humans are likely to bring to bear. That was a very complex way of saying something as simple as if I have something wrong with me and I go to the doctor, uh, it might be harder for me to get the uh, good advice that I need from my doctor than it would be if we were consulting uh, regression, a predictive model, some other source of information. My question for you is, as we head into a world where we're going to have more access to predictive models, more artificial intelligence, more thorough use of machine learning models where we can actually iron out some of the biases we bring to events. Should we be relying on that more and on humans less? And for what kinds of decisions? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Obviously a very pointed question at Google, which has been subject to repeated attacks for reliance on algorithms and, and, and uh, pu pushing algorithmic analyses and, and big data. 
The irony being that one of the findings in psychology that really does replicate, that is since the 1950s, is that if you compare the predictive performance of a human expert with a, you know, forget deep learning, forget artificial intelligence, a, a stupid regression equation where you throw in you know, five or 10 predictor variables, you weight them, you add them up. You don't even have to necessarily have to weight, weight them. You can just um, you normalize them, standardize them and add them up. The, the algorithm always wins. By algorithm here, I mean, you know, 1950s era regression equation. Uh, all the more so when the machine learning is more sophisticated than just adding up a bunch of variables. Now, people have a lot of trouble um, swallowing this, even though it is a replicable finding. Of course, it's not true all of the time, and it's only as good as the data. And there, there are, as I'm sure this audience knows better than I, many ways in which an algorithm can mislead, depending on the, the data that it's fed. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I think our society has to get used to the idea that we all probably overvalue and um, <clears throat> uh, give too much credence to human judges, at least when it comes to predictions based on a number of, of, uh, of variables. This shouldn't be that shocking. And Paul Meal, who's the psychologist starting in the 50s, who um, made this discovery and, and kind of rubbed uh, everyone's faces in it, said, well, you know, at the supermarket checkout line, if you were to throw a bunch of your, all, all your groceries on, on the belt and say, well, it looks to me like it's about, it's about $75, uh, should, should we just you know, leave it at that? Is that okay? You know, the cashier would say, well, no, I, I don't trust your ability to just eyeball a bunch of groceries and to come up with the, the sum. And likewise, when it comes to a number of variables that combine to predict some outcome, you know, wh why should we trust human uh, numerical intuition? Granted, we do have pattern learning and it can be sensitive to uh, probabilities, but we should um, deal with the fact that, that indeed in many cases where there could be life and death outcomes, such as medical diagnosis, <clears throat> the unaided human mind is probably uh, in most cases worse than the algorithm. And indeed, one of the, the really shocking findings is sometimes the aided human mind is worse than the algorithm. That is, you give the expert um, the, the results of the uh, formula and say, well, you know, take it or leave it, fold that into your own judgment, and they often do worse than the formula itself. You know, not, not always, but that, that can often happen. So what do we, uh, how are we going to deal with that? Um, and again, you know, this audience knows, uh, can appreciate far better than I that this has been the, the result of um, you know, widespread attacks. And, and there are the notorious cases of the, you know, the, 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 the algorithms that are racist and, um, uh, and, and some spectacular fails. Um, uh, it, it, humans always have to be in the loop because they've obviously got to be the ones who choose the algorithm decide whether the algorithm might itself be biased or misleading in all the ways that algorithms can be. Uh, and it's human values that trade off the advantages and disadvantages of algorithms. So we're not talking about getting humans out of the loop. Also, in many cases, it's humans that provide the variables they, that because the brain is still much better at, you know, at vision and at language and at common sense, uh, humans are the ones who are going to generate the data that get fed into the algorithms. So it's, we're not talking about humans being out of the loop, but I think we ought to be talking about how crappy human judgment could be made better by uh, analysis of big data, possibly you know, saving lives, medical diagnosis being um, the paramount case, perhaps reading x-rays, but also even combining individual genomic analysis, which is going to be increasingly important because we know that different people react differently to different drugs. I'm sure, you know, if, if there are three of you, uh, I guess you're not sitting in an audience, you're all watching at home or uh, behind your screen, but you ask three people, just, you know, can you, can you drink caffeine after dinner? Uh, just keep you up. And one says, oh yeah, it keeps me up. I can't do it. And then one says, oh, it doesn't bother me at all. I mean, our, our internal biochemistry is different. There's no way that a human doctor can keep track of all that. The, uh, drugs interact with each other. Uh, uh, we know that <clears throat> physicians overinterpret 
diagnostic tests and uh, neglect base rates. There's the famous medical diagnosis problems where physicians presented with simple data on prevalence of a disease, false positive rate, sensitivity of a test, and they're off, like they're just way off. They're nowhere close in estimating the probability that someone has a, a disease based on a positive test result. So in all these cases, I think if a judicious use of algorithmic uh, uh, results could lead in, in much better judgments. Again, a long-winded answer to a yeah. simple well, question. It's a complex topic. You know, one of the things I'm worried about, um, if I start to rely more on the models, the algorithms, uh, I might get lazy. And so I'm thinking about, uh, I recently got a watch, which I hadn't had since I was a kid. It still takes me like three seconds, I know, because I can time it, uh, to figure out what time it is on the watch because I'm used to looking at the digital time on my phone. Right, or right. I, don't even, I don't even know if I could find where I am on an actual map and where I want to go and map my way there because I have my, my map. Are you at all worried that as we rely more on technology to make rational decisions for us, we'll be less capable of making rational decisions for ourselves? Yeah, it is a concern, and I know I know what you're talking about because uh, a couple of years ago, I, I bought my stepdaughter a watch as I'm coming back in the airport, and she looked at me kind of sheepishly and said, "Well, thanks, but I don't know how to tell time." Uh, you know, this is a person with Ivy League education, and so on. This is the kind of thing that you know, I you know, we we used to learn in you know in 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 kindergarten, you know, the big hands on the five and little hands on the seven. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I learned this is true. In uh, I learned how to use a slide rule in my first year in college. Even then, it was a little bit of kind of an antique skill. It's kind of like, and, and there was something a little bit cool about it, kind of like listening to vinyl instead of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, st digital streaming. Um, but I learned, this is true, I learned how to calculate square roots with paper and pencil. And trust me, it is tedious. And now that, and even then, it, they were just introducing handheld calculators where, you know, you just boink one button, you get the square root made that skill instantly obsolete. If I, without a, uh, and I've forgotten now how to do it, and you know, certainly none of you know how to do it. So yes, you'd be in the dark if you had to calculate a square root without a calculator. On the other hand, you know, we have calculators and I think no one misses the skill of computing square roots. And I suppose if for some reason, all of our calculators went dark, um, you know, we'd, re we'd relearn it as long as that knowledge uh, had not vanished. So, um, you know, while there is something to be that's lost in the ability to read a map or to, you know, tell, tell the time from an analog watch face, um, you know, it's probably not, uh, you know, on the whole, it's probably not a, uh, a serious problem as long okay, as we have the technology. Yeah. All right. I won't worry too much about it then. Um, so I have another question for you. Uh, you had an amusing beginning to the book that really grabbed me. I said, I need to know the answer to this question, too. Uh, you wrote um, uh, that social science, the tools of social science and everything you've been teaching your students did not enable you to answer questions like, why do people believe Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring out of a pizzeria? And I was like, I don't know why they believe that either. Um, so throughout the book, you have different uh, explanations for how we can sort of go down logical rat holes or not be logical at all. But there was one thing that you said that I, I wanted to ask you about, uh, which is sometimes people believe things they don't really believe at all. And you differentiate between two zones, the reality zone and the myth zone. And each of them has its own sort of rationality to it. Can you talk about the distinction between them and, and what do you mean by that? Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up because it turned out to, I think, be a, a crucial <clears throat> tool for making sense of these utterly preposterous beliefs. You, you kind of slap yourself in the forehead and you say, how could someone believe that? There's no evidence. Uh, and, and, this, and I appeal here to a distinction originally made by the social psychologist Robert Abelson and uh, independently by the anthropologist uh, Dan Sperber and uh, with Hugo, Hugo Mercier which is that there are some beliefs that people um, hold not so much because they literally believe that they describe actual reality, um, <clears throat> the same way you believe either there's beer in the fridge or there isn't beer in the fridge, but rather they're in a zone where um, <clears throat> they kind of express a, uh, a moral value, an attitude, 
uh, you don't expect them to ever be able to prove whether it's true or false because there are some things that, you know, at least in our <clears throat> our evolutionary history and our recent history, you could never find out. You know, why do what's the origin of the universe? Well, you know, until we had uh, ways of detecting the cosmic background radiation and some you know, pretty fancy math and the, the redshift of stars, uh, that's not a question anyone could answer anyway. So uh, a creation myth was as good as anything else. You know, until we had archives of what uh, and careful notes about what happens in 10 Downing Street and the White House and, 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 and the, 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 the Vatican, there's no way you could actually know what the great, the, the, the powerful leaders of the world were actually discussing. And why do bad things happen to good people? Why does one person uh, come down with a disease that kills them and another person not? You know, again, these are all kind of cosmic questions. And I think a natural response of the human mind uh, is to, to think, well, those beliefs are, uh, since you can't find out, I should believe them to the extent that they are ennobling, entertaining, empowering. Uh, they convey the right moral values. Uh, truth or falsehood has nothing to do with it in, in the beer in the fridge sense. And so someone who says Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring out of a Washington pizzeria, what they're really saying is, Hillary, boo. Uh, namely, this is a, I'm going to say something terrible about her to convey the idea that she is such a uh, depraved person that that's the kind of thing she could do. Now, you and I would say, well, well, wait a second, you know, you have the right to hate anyone you want to hate, and, you know, I'm not going to you know, defend Hillary Clinton or anything, but, you know, it really matters whether she did that or didn't do that. Now, that's the kind of exotic, uh, modern, unnatural conviction that many educated people have had since the Enlightenment, namely, your beliefs matter, and you should know, you should only hold them if they are true in the same sense that there's that there's beer in the fridge is true. But that's not a natural human way of thinking. Uh, it is a gift of the enlightenment or a gift or if you want a, a curse, but it is a mindset that we have that every one of our beliefs has to be testable, justifiable, uh, held to account as to whether it is literally true or false. For a lot of people, a lot of the time, beliefs are expressions of value and identity. And who, can, you know, you can't find out anyway. Uh, and stop being so pedantic, asking whether yep. it really happened. Yep, oh, that's great. And and you point out in the book, uh, to our knowledge, very few people actually called the police or intervened with this <laughs> particular pizzeria, even while professing that a sex ring was being run out of it. So. When the behavior uh, is called for people, to, their conviction is not driving that, which is another example. It also, for me, um, uh, uh, helped me understand how I can have a rational conversation with my relative on some topics while they also believe this to be true or drive down the highway and know we're all going to be obeying the traffic rules, even while we have such disparate beliefs about some of these things. So um, that was helpful. Another, uh, I thought, really core part of the book was um, the sort of tragedy of the commons dilemma we find ourselves in today. So many of the big issues that we as a planet are facing, we as a society are facing, are, uh, are common resource dilemmas, where in order for us to see improvement in the environment, all of us have to do something. If one of us does it, uh, and nobody else does. The environment doesn't get better, and I live a less rich life because I've deprived myself of things. Um, yeah, you'd offer a couple of solutions to this dilemma, and I'm wondering if you can offer some advice for those of us who are really struggling with how do we improve things when it's not just us who has the power to change it. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> the, the book has a chapter on game theory. Because it is crucial to understanding questions, uh, many questions, uh, among them the one that, that you and I just uh, ranged over, namely, why do people uh, assert preposterous beliefs? Well, it can be pretty rational to assert them if denying them uh, makes you a pariah in your social group. If you're in a part of the country where everyone denies climate change, if you assert it, that's a highly irrational thing to do in terms of your social standing within the group. You'll be a, a non-person. 
Perversely, if everyone does what's rational by the nat narrow criterion of will it earn me respect within my clique, then we can end up with a, a society, a democratic society, in which no one is motivated to vote for the the, the, the people in the positions with the most justifiable um, uh, evidence. Uh, in the case of, uh, to, to switch examples now, and you brought up climate, uh, the dilemma that we face both as individuals and across countries is that it's uh, only rational to conserve, to, to um, uh, not emit greenhouse gases, which you know come from a, a very convenient source, namely very dense and, and, and portable fossil fuels. Energy is a good thing. It, it's necessary to do pretty much anything. Uh, and to forego cheap energy in order to save the planet is in a sense irrational if you're the only one doing it because you suffer all the disadvantages. You're the one who's you know, shivering in the winter and sweating in the summer and standing in a rainy bus stop while other people are driving. Your sacrifice isn't going to save the planet. Um, and so you may as well uh, you know, dr drive your SUV to work and, and crank up the air conditioning. It doesn't affect the planet either way. But of course, it does affect the planet when every individual takes their, their SUV. More pointedly, when every country <coughs> uh, is tempted to burn coal, coal to uh, increase its GDP. So the only way out of a uh, it goes by a, a number of names, the tragedy of the commons, negative externality, uh, public goods game, is if the rules change so that it, um, say if there's punishment for taking the self-interested but collectively damaging option, uh, then people can learn to factor in those incentives. And um, individually, it's in their interests to do what is also in everyone's interest to do. In the case of car carbon, the obvious solution is carbon pricing, because that means that uh, your incentives are changed so that conserving uh, is in your interest because you don't want to pay all that you know, money to the government for the, the carbon you burn. The, this introduces other problems, even though every economist on the right and the left believes in carbon pricing. The psychological problem is when you impose it, then people put on yellow vests and they start to, you know, to, to block traffic and turn cars upside down and set them on fire. Uh, carbon taxes being <clears throat> unpopular because they're regressive, so that calls for some way of, of, of sweetening carbon prices, uh, carbon taxes, I mean. Uh, and maybe even better still is if we had technological innovation that made clean energy cheaper than dirty energy well, that kind of gets us out of the tragedy of the com carbon commons, that what people would do in their individual self-interest uh, would also conduce to the interest of everyone considered together. So it's a way of thinking about climate change that doesn't rely on what I think is a dead-end strategy of kind of guilting everyone to try to uh, conserve individually it just won't, uh, or countries. That just won't add up to save the planet. Thank you. Um, I know we've got some questions from our viewers, and so let's switch over to that. Uh, the first one comes from Mark Zhu. What are your thoughts on choosing how and when to rein in our evolutionarily programmed behavior that might make us less satisfied? For example, overeating, status comparisons, tribalism. Yeah, it's um, it's basically the the, the kind of classical moral consideration that um, your, as I sometimes put it, your freedom to swing your arms ends where my nose begins. That is, we should indulge them to the extent that they, uh, at least those evolutionary urges that give us pleasure, that, that, uh, <clears throat> that satisfy us, but not if it harms other people. You know, that, that's where you draw the line. And certainly indulging misunderstandings well, if you want to believe myths, you know, in the privacy of your own home on your own time, okay. When you start, when it starts to affect legislation uh, or policy, that that's not okay. Um, so, so that would that that would be the guideline. And what it means is there are an awful lot of cases in which our beliefs, <clears throat> especially in a democracy, uh, ought to be if, obviously not policed, but at least nudged and argued against. And we should learn habits of 
cognitive self-control in the same way that we learn um, not to eat all the delicious food in front of us. Thank you. Uh, let's take another one. Um, Gorov writes, do you think social media has a role in promoting the irrationality? Is there a possibility for a society where social media and rationality can coexist? <clears throat> yeah, it's this is an issue where I've uh, I've started to change my mind because I I was a big um, kind of desister resistor to the bandwagon where all of society's ills are blamed on social media. And you know if you read if you read the New York Times, it's like every day here's another problem where social media is the villain. Um, and uh, you know I think some of the phenomena blamed on social media were overblown. Probably fake news being an example that turns out that it, it uh, very few people have their minds changed by by uh, fake news. It mostly uh, kind of entertains people who are already partisans rather than changing people's minds. Uh, on, on the other hand, I, I, I have been persuaded by a, a recent book by Jonathan Rauch called The Constitution of Knowledge, which um, in many ways harmonizes with, with my own book, Rationality, in identifying uh, the accomplishments of human rationality with institutions and norms that make us collectively more rational than any of us could hope to be individually, thereby resolving the paradox of how one species could be both so rational and so irrational at the same time. Uh, the ans answer being that even though all of us are susceptible to flaws and illusions and fallacies and biases, we're pretty good at spotting other people's fallacies and, and biases, at least we're better. So if you th put people together in a, a kind of arena where there are rules that are designed to bring out objectivity, truth, rules like peer review, uh, fact checking, editing, uh, empirical testing, um, open debate and criticism, then and, and a commitment to finding the truth, then the uh, that whole institution can often move toward objectivity and, and truth, even if it's composed of a bunch of individuals who, uh, each one of whom is subject to all of these biases. And what Rausch points out is that if you look at the institutions that have succeeded, <clears throat> you know, like responsible journalism, like science, uh, they have, they, they slow down deliberation, they do an, a huge amount of filtering of all of the claims, only a tiny number get accepted as uh, accurate. Then if you look at what social media does, it's almost the exact opposite. It's almost like uh, every rule that ordinarily makes us more rational is disabled or flouted in social media. That is, the reaction is instantaneous. There is no filtering. People get a reputation for notoriety, and, and, and shareability rather than for factual accuracy. And so there's a lot in social media that kind of militates against the um, kind of taming of the crowd toward more rational outcomes. Now, what we can do about it is, is not clear because social media, uh, this is a, <clears throat> there's a great amount of amnesia for what we all wished for in the 90s and before, which is then there was the complaint that uh, all of our information comes from an oligarchy of special interests. How come, you know, the New York Times and the Encyclopedia Britannica get to determine what's true? Uh, there was a cliche at the time that freedom of the press uh, belongs to those who own one. Um, Noam Chomsky had his book, The Manufacture of Consent. And the idea then was, we should let give everyone a voice. You shouldn't have to own a press to have your opinions um, uh, made available. Well, you know, be careful what you wish for. We now no longer, no one complains about the manufacture of consent anymore. It's quite the opposite. It's way too democratic. Now, how you resolve that, um, that tension between the possible distortions of an oligopoly of knowledge and the <clears throat> proliferation of, you know, fake news and rumors and conspiracy theories when you democratize information too much, we haven't really resolved. I don't think anyone knows the answer. We might have to grope toward it, uh, trying different combinations of tweaking of the algorithms, 
external criticism um, and and uh, we're, we're in un, uncharted territory here. Certainly just heavy-handed, ham-fisted censorship by social media companies probably won't be the answer either. Thank you. Uh, let's take another question. Sandeep, how do we deeply incorporate in education of children methodologies to deprogram our innate evolutionary cognitive biases and strengthen traits like compassion, interconnection, reason, and happiness? Yeah, so I don't know, like, pedagogically, what's the most effective uh, technique, but I agree that this should be woven into education, um, particularly, <clears throat> I guess I've spoken more to the uh, overcoming our cognitive uh, legacy from, from evolution. I do think that critical thinking, probability, logic should be woven into the curriculum, starting as young as possible, but continuing through high school and college, and for that matter, should be part of our public discourse. Uh, this is, that is, in op-eds, in um, you know, te televised debates, people should not get away with arguing from anecdote uh, or base rate neglect or arguing ad hominem or arguing from, from authority. These are aspirations of the so-called rationality community, and I suspect that many of uh, the, the, the watchers and listeners would uh, identify that. But there, there are values that should be uh, kind of incorporated into all our discourse starting in education. In terms of empathy and compassion, there too, I wrote about this in The Better Angels of Our Nature, there is some reason to think that um, consuming fiction, of the, of the, at least of the right kind, can get people into the habits of inhabiting other people's perspectives, vantage points, see what the world is like if you are uh, a, a peasant in a South Asian vill village, an African American in an American uh, inner city, a, a gay person in a homopho homophobic community. So that those kind of first person simulations that we have through fiction can be a technique that expands people's circles of uh, compassion. Great, thanks. And you also write about uh, openness to evidence, I believe it's called, as a, as a trait that can keep us um, more open to multiple points of view, information, and rational thinking. Yes, it is a dimension along which people vary. At one end, the uh, it's based, perhaps encapsulated by the famous quote misattributed to John Maynard Keynes when he was accused of, uh, of flip-flopping or changing his mind. And he said, well, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Now, it turns out Keynes probably didn't say it, but you know, that's okay. Someone said it, probably Paul Samuelson another economist, but it is a good uh, a creed to live by. And it does go against a streak of human nature, which says that the flip flopper is weak and is um, manipulable and that we should value the steadfast, courageous person who sticks with his convictions and beliefs no matter what. Now, when you think about it, that trait of human nature of valuing steadfastness and uh, a principle is kind of perverse because uh, you know, none of us is infallible, none of us is omniscient. It's inevitable that many of our beliefs will be false, maybe even most of them. And being open to evidence is a, a cognitive virtue, the, the, the Keynesian quote. Uh, and, and indeed, um, research by Gordon Pennycook and his collaborators has shown that people who are more open to evidence also are really more rational in uh, by a variety of criteria, such as they're less likely to believe in conspiracy theories, less likely to believe in paranormal woo-woo, uh, and less likely to be taken in by um, uh, kind of pseudo-intellectual gobbledygook bullshit, uh, where you string a bunch of pompous phrases together and people think that it's saying something profound. There's a bunch of virtues that seem to go together with being open to evidence. Thank you. Um, I like woo-woo. Uh... I haven't heard that before. So uh, we're almost out of time. We've only got a few minutes. So I'm going to ask the final question here. Um, so I know now uh, that rationality holds the key to predicting the future because in page 283 of your book, you wrote, as soon as I mentioned the topic of rationality, people ask me why humanity appears to be losing its mind. That was actually going to be my first question to you. As I was keeping my question list, I threw it off the list and decided to sort of end with it. My question to you is this, 
Do you feel like we are entering into an era where there's more irrational or more consequential irrationality than we've experienced in years past? Or is that simply the availability heuristic at play? Yeah, hard to tell because we don't have a kind of constant yardstick of how much irrationality is out there. Uh, in terms of consequential irrationality, you might say, well, nothing can beat um, the uh, stop the steal conspiracy theory. But, you know, on the other hand, we we had, you know, certainly a lot of reactions of, of, of terrible consequences of belief in the protocols of the elders of Zion and other anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, you know, such as the Holocaust, of errors like the uh, uh, perhaps the, 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 the Vietnam War from the um, fake news about the Gulf of Tonkin attack, of um, the invasion of, of Iraq because of um, both false reports of weapons of mass destruction and the vague sense that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. Uh, so the, it, it's not new. Whether it's worse or not is really hard to tell. It might be worse, but it, it, it might not. I looked at one measure because I, I like to plot graphs of um, social indicators over, over the decades. And I was, uh, a lot of them showing improvement. That's the basis of my previous books, The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now. How, how there has been genuine progress. Uh, so I looked for data on belief in astrology, belief in ghosts, belief in paranormal phenomena. And to my disappointment, it's pretty flat over 50 years. I was hoping that those beliefs had gone down. So that's an kind of indicator that it hasn't gotten uh, worse, but it hasn't gotten better. Okay, so interesting. Well, I wanna thank you so much for uh, the time today, but also for writing this book. I definitely feel like I have the tools to be more rational now. I hope it sticks. And um, I would encourage all of you, if you if you have the time and the interest, grab this and read it because you'll learn a lot. Uh, so Dr. Pinker, thank you again for your time. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to speak at Google. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.